in the introduction, Rabbi, but then after that, you come to John. Hello, everyone. I'm Nadine Abusha Cohen, and one of the What Matters facilitators here at Park Avenue Synagogue. On behalf of my co-facilitators, Marsha Colvin, Erica Friedman, Rita Moser, and Nan Rubin, I want to welcome those of you who are here and those who are on live stream. A couple of hours ago, we screened the movie, The Last Flight Home. And every time I see it, I'm struck by how much it dovetails with what matters. What, although you'll be hearing more about the process tonight, I want to share with you what Rabbi Zuckerman said in a sermon as we were jump-starting this initiative. And I quote, Taking part in a What Matters conversation does not imply a death sentence. It is actually giving the gift of resolution to ourselves and to others. Who shall live and who shall die is not an idea that only applies to Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. It is an idea that speaks to our core, our autonomy to make decisions for ourselves. End of quote. I am thrilled that tonight's program, we are partnering with a number of organizations and synagogues. And I'd like to acknowledge here with us Rabbi Amy Ehrlich and members of Temple Emmanuel, Stephanie Lasher and Mary Harkavy, co-chairs of What Matters at Rod of Shalom, along with fellow congregants. Stephanie Gary, Executive Vice President, Communal Partnerships, Plaza Jewish Community Chapel, which has been a generous funder and partner of What Matters, and the Shomer Collective, an organization that offers a wide array of resources and programs guided by Jewish wisdom, values, and practices. But last but not least, I'd like to acknowledge and thank Mara Bernstein, Director of Adult Programming here at Park Avenue Synagogue, and her team who, as always, have made this evening run smoothly and flawlessly. Before we begin, Sally Kaplan, the founding director of What Matters, and a mentor and a dear friend to the What Matters team at Park Avenue Synagogue, will say a few words. Sally. Thank you. Thank you, Nadine. You and the Park Avenue Synagogue team have been incredible partners without whose help this program would not nearly be the success that it clearly is. I'd like to take just a moment to explain a little bit to you about the What Matters initiative. All of the uh, What Matters partners who Nadine so beautifully acknowledged tonight are a model for how the New York Jewish community can work together to address an important topic that impacts us all, in this case, end-of-life conversations. Did you know that 92% of Americans say it's important to discuss their end-of-life wishes for health care, and yet only about one-third of the people in this country have actually had such a conversation? This is the gap that What Matters seeks to reduce. And how do we do it? We train facilitators who can take you through the advanced care planning process and help you appoint a healthcare agent who can speak for you if you're unable to speak for yourself and complete your advanced directives such as the healthcare proxy and the living well form. We talk to you about your goals, wishes, and values and how to communicate those wishes to the important people in your lives. And we can meet with you either one-on-one -on -one or in a group, larger group setting. If you wish to schedule a conversation, a What Matters conversation, or have additional questions after this evening, each of the partnering synagogues here tonight have What Matters teams, so feel free to reach out to them directly. And in the coming days, we will follow up with a letter telling you exactly how you can contact them and read more about the What Matters initiative online. And now, turning to tonight's program. Many of you have seen, or maybe just came upstairs from seeing The Last Flight Home. And for those of you who have not yet had the opportunity, I hope that tonight's conversation will inspire you to do so. It can be viewed on Paramount Plus. 
And speaking of inspiring, I'd now like to take a moment to introduce two of the most thoughtful and informed people on this topic and all things end of life that I know. First, our guest, Rabbi Rachel Timoner, who is featured in the film. Rachel serves as senior rabbi of Congregation Beth Elohim in Park Slope, Brooklyn. Prior to her current role, she served as associate rabbi of Leo Beck Temple in Los Angeles. She's a graduate of Yale University, received her rabbinic ordination from Hebrew Union College, Jewish Institute of Religion, and was a Wexner Graduate Fellow. Rabbi Timona serves on the board of many organizations, including the New York Board of Rabbis, UJA Federation of New York, and Plaza Jewish Community Chapel. And you're all familiar with Rabbi Neil Zuckerman of Park Avenue Synagogue, and fortunately for us at What Matters, he's the lead clergy of the What Matters Initiative here at Park Avenue Synagogue, and has been a leader, a mentor, and an incredible guide for this project. He will lead the conversation tonight with Rabbi Timoner. Please know that there will be a designated time at the end for questions, and I will leave it with that. Thank you for participating tonight, and I turn it over to our esteemed speakers. Thank you. Thank you, Sally. <clears throat> Sally, thank you for being here. Thank you for all you do around this initiative. And uh, it's an ab absolute pleasure to work together. Uh, I want to acknowledge Stephanie Gary as well, who not only uh, has pushed this uh, initiative forward, but so many community projects, including speaking to my intro to Judaism class about death and dying on a regular basis. So, uh, and Rabbi Ehrlich, I want to thank you for being here. Uh, Mara, thank you as always for making the, this, this happen. And Nadine, um, this wouldn't have happened without you. So thank you for pushing and uh, for getting this done. And uh, it's a great gift to be able to work with you. So uh, Rabbi Timoner, welcome. Thank you for, for joining us tonight uh, in Manhattan. And um, thank you for having me. We, as you know, many people uh, were viewing the film before, before they came up to the sanctuary. Um, it's a, it, it is a, one time a, um, a devastating, beautiful, life-affirming uh, film about end of life. And um, so thank you for being here to discuss it. It's obviously something that's extraordinarily personal to you. Um, so we were chatting a little bit beforehand, some, some background to the film that I wasn't aware of. And I'm wondering if you could just talk us through how, how does this, uh, go from your father calling you and saying, I want to die, to a document hour and roughly a half mm -hmm. uh, okay. documentary about this? Well, so my father was someone who, I think maybe you could tell if you saw the film, was just full of life and um, not a quitter. And um, when he got to the point where when he was suddenly, very suddenly, desperate to die. Um, sure. Um, when he, when, so my father was a go-getter. He was full of energy, full of life, um, and not a quitter. And uh, he had been disabled for 40 years, but he never complained. He never talked about, he never kind of lost his, desire to be here and to be with us. He always wanted to be here for the next thing. And it was never, it, it would never occur to us that he'd be someone who would want to die. But suddenly one day he reached his limit and he, he, he didn't just want to die, he needed to die. And he would call us, I live here, my sister and brother live in LA, if you saw the film, you know that. He would call us on rotation please, Rachel, you have to help me die. You have to help me die today. I need to die today. You have to help me. And it was shocking and upsetting and so out of character. And, um, and time passed. It wasn't like he was just depressed for a moment. It was, it was, it was ongoing. And you know, I would say, Dad, I can't, I can't help you die. I, I, I'll talk. I'll listen. I'll, I did guided meditations with him about kind of like letting go and you know I I I um tried to be a supportive presence but like I I, I can't help you die I, I, 
And then my brother found out that there was a law in California and actually he could make this choice. And I'm sure we'll get to the whole question about Jewish law and Jewish tradition, but just putting that aside for now, when, as soon as my father realized that he had a choice, his entire spirit lifted. He was determined to get to the point where he could start the clock and make it happen. And never from the first moment he said, I need to die now, to the very end did he waver on that at all. Why, why do you think that, well, I mean, you know, your father is, I mean, he, had, he was surrounded by family, he, I mean, beloved by his children and grandchildren and by your mother. What, before, you know, I, mean, I know we're gonna get to how this film gets made, but what, what was it, what, what, what switch flipped in your father? I mean, he was, he was hospitalized, so he was, he'd been falling a lot, he, he was 92. He'd been disabled since he was 52. He, he started to really not be able to walk. He had, he had been able to walk haltingly with a cane for many years. It was very frustrating for him, but he could do it. He'd get to the bathroom. He could take care of himself in some basic ways. When he, well, he started to fall a lot, and then he started having problems breathing. And that, pro that was going on for probably five, seven years. And he was, he was on oxygen. He had COPD. He turns out he also had congestive heart, congestive heart failure. He was really struggling to breathe. And the combination and then the hospitalization around the breathing meant he wasn't going to walk again. And I think for him, I think that he had kind of soldiered on with his disability for a very, very long time. And he, this was like the last, the last thing. He just did not want to be confined to a bed for very mm -hmm. long. He just did not want that to be his life. And, um, and, and because he had this, you know, very, he had an accident when he, I don't know who's seen it, who hasn't seen it, but he had an accident in his early 50s. He was an athlete. He was a CEO of an airline. <clears throat> and he had his, he went for a massage. He had his neck cracked and it caused a stroke suddenly and permanent disability. And so he had just, with the best possible attitude, adjusted to that and done his best. And it was not easy and he'd done it for 40 years. And so when he decided, I am done, we all just were like, how can we support you? Just, just you, you get to make the call. Like, you, you, have, you, have, you have been here in this world as a like, active, loving presence for us, for our kids, and now we wanna love you back. And this is what you're asking for? How can we be there to help you? So we'll get to that maybe more, but the question you asked was about the film. So my sister, is a documentary filmmaker. She's made many films. She um, has won Sundance twice. She's, she's a successful filmmaker. And one of the things that's interesting about her is that she films everything all the time. We, are, we as her family members, are used to being on film, um, not on a, on a screen, but just she collects footage all the time. Um, some of the footage in the film of me in New York was, take, was taken years before that she just like comes and films me and she just films us. I don't know why she does that, but she does. And so she said she wanted to put up cameras in the room when we knew that he was gonna be coming home. And everybody else was good with it. He was good with it. I didn't want it, but I wasn't gonna make a thing about it. It was obviously dad's choice. If he wanted it, okay. But there was no, but nobody was talking about an actual film that people would watch ever. And, um, after dad died, we had, we had the funeral, and then we had a memorial on Zoom because it was COVID. And, um, and I asked my sister, could you put together some images just for like a short slideshow of pictures of him on the Zoom? You know, we all did this right during COVID. We, there, so like there was a little slideshow, and <clears throat> she sat down to do it, got into the footage, and couldn't stop, and made a 32-minute little film that became like the the center of the memorial service, a 32 minute film. So that process got her realizing, I need to do something with this. And she, like a couple of months later, realized she really was making a film and called me, because I'm the one who would be the most opposed. And my first reaction was, no, this is private. Like this is not, this is not something for the public. 
Obviously, I didn't win that she, debate. I was going to say, <laughs> she, she won that one. Yeah, I mean, the main decisive factor was that my mom, in her grief, was watching the footage that my sister was putting together as a way of mourning. And it was so healing for her. And she watched it every night. And she very much wanted this film to be made. And so again, I was like, this is not about me. You, you know, what's interesting is, as, you, as I think back on the film and for those who, who just watched it, the family members are so vulnerable. It's, as, it's almost as if they're not aware that the that camera's being even filmed. there, right? <laughs> yeah. And, and now we know, yeah. right? I mean, other than that, yeah. there's a scene where yeah. I think your he, niece is talking about being, he's Mike, does he want to be Mike? Mike does he yeah. know he's Mike? Yeah. And, and, but, I mean, the, the, the emotions are just raw. Yeah. Very, so, I, I mean, I can understand your reluctance. And was it, was it your mother that actually... Convinced me. Sort of convinced you that this Absolutely. would be... Absolutely. I felt like if this is meaningful to her, if this is helping her in her lowest time, I'm not gonna stand in the way of that. Um, I wasn't comfortable, um, I didn't want it, but I wasn't gonna stop it. And then I thought, oh, it'll be like a little film, no one's gonna see this. And then it got, to, it got into Sundance and I, was, I realized, oh, people are gonna see this. And so then I also then realized that I had another issue, which is that I'm a rabbi and my father ended his life. Right. And I needed to deal with that. So then I wrote a piece in the foreword trying to communicate how I could be in that, in that situation and what it, what it had taught me. So we're gonna come back to that because I actually have the forward piece okay. right here. Uh, and it's a great piece and there, it's a very thoughtful piece and a lot for us. Uh, I mean, there's just so much, I think Nadine, you said it or Sally, that dovetails with this what matters conversation and what makes for a meaningful life. And, and a life that we want to live. Um, but I want to stay with you for a minute and, and your, your role as rabbi because it, I think it's a, it's a significant plot line, even if it's not a stated plot line. But and, and I, I noticed that in the first half of the film, you're, you're almost sort of absent, right? I mean, you're, you know, you're, you're yep. there on Zoom. Yep. You show up, I think, around seven days yep. left. Um, but it, it seems like you're... Um, I mean, you, you are clearly um, supporting his decision, but it's a lot of your brother and sister mm -hmm. talking about it. And, and I even noticed at the end when, um, when they're preparing the medication, mm -hmm. you're, not, you're not there, right? That's not, you know, so the whole time I'm, I'm rooting for you to be a daughter, mm. right? Because I know anyone, any of us who are clergy, you know, know that there are times in our lives when I don't want to be the parent. I don't want to be the rabbi. I want to be the father. I want to be the son. I want to be a mourner. I don't right. And and it's a real tension. And I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about those tensions. Yeah. And, and you know, when I was ordained, um, I remember like really soon after my ordination, my dad asked to talk to me, and he said, "When I die, I want you to do my funeral." And I right away said, no, dad, when you die, we're gonna have a different rabbi do your funeral and I'm gonna be your daughter. And he said, no, I really want you to do my funeral. And I said, well, we'll, we'll talk more about it. I, wasn't, I didn't give in, but I ultimately, in time, we had that conversation multiple times and I just realized this is so important to him. You know, it's it, okay. So I knew, I was not surprised when we got to this moment that that's what he wanted. We had talked about it for a long time. Um, and yet it's complicated. And also it took, you know, it, mean, it meant that for a lot of the times that we were together, and there were a whole bunch of Zoom calls. He, he and I had an evening, you know, a nightly Zoom call that is talked about, but of course you don't see them all. Um, you know, for those, an hour every night, just one-on-one, -on -one, um, I was taking care of him. I was being his rabbi. and. There is obviously loss there for me in that. I didn't get to do the daughter thing. But I also, like, what do I want as his daughter? Like, really, ultimately, if I could have just been the daughter, what would I have wanted? I, have, I would have wanted to love him in every way I could love him, uh, to show him my love in every possible way. He was asking for a very specific thing he needed, and I was able to give it to him. There's kind of nothing better than that. Yeah. Like, really, what do I want more than that? And especially when it came time 
you know, for the Vidui, where I thought, where I thought, you know, what are the chances that he's going to like fully open up and release things? And and then he did in a way that made a very big difference. I was very grateful that I was a rabbi. I mean, I would say it made a huge difference, right? And. I thought it was, and I don't know, I can't speak for, for everyone, but I, I thought it was the most powerful, I, I mean, I'm a rabbi, so. Right? so <laughs> a little um, biased. Right, but so I thought it was the most powerful moment of the film. And, and, and the backstory of your father's life is so critical here, right? Because, you know, the stroke, and as you said, the, you know, he was, lar I mean, he seemed larger than life, and the CEO, and on TV, and all that was, sort of taken away. And so take, so help take us through that, that V. Dewey moment, um, because it was so raw and it was so both rabbinic and loving. Um, and I, I also just love the moment when your sister was- Interrupted. <laughs> you're like, shh. <laughs> I mean, I got a job to do here. Uh -huh. um, and I'm, I'm the older sister, yeah, so you know, there was a little, was I could pull rank I mean, a little bit there. It. So uh -huh. just, Take us through that moment. Uh, it was it was yeah. incredible. Um, I knew we all knew that that time in Dad's life when he plummeted from the heights and you know lost his wealth, lost his status, lost a lot of his friends, lost his business associates, like lost everything. Just, um, it was it was such so, so scarring. And but I didn't know quite how much he was still holding it. Uh, I suspected, I, I wasn't, you know, I suspected, but I, I didn't really know. I didn't know what was gonna come out, you know, I, uh, in Vidui, and, uh, or anything, if anything would. And he just, when I arrived, it was the first moment when I arrived, that, uh, he said something, he said, I'm crying inside. And it's on the film, it's in the film, but he, they, she doesn't show the whole thing, but he, he started to tell me some things that he was, as approaching the end of life, was, was, was feeling. And we talked about it a little bit. And got interrupted or whatever, it didn't go that long. And I thought, like, okay, for sure, when we get, when, when he gives me, if he gives me permission to do this, I want to make a space for him. And, um, you know, just so painful to hear his shame, his self-hatred, his, I don't know, maybe self-hatred is too strong, but like self-incrimination, like really blaming himself for something that was utterly not his fault. Um, and, 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 and at the root of it was that he, like I, what I say in the, in the sermon at the end, like he had understood that his value in life was being a provider for us. That was his role, that was his kind of fundamental responsibility and he felt like he failed on that responsibility and that that made him a failure in life. And that was just like, it's, it's so crushing to hear that, that, that he, he, he was 92 years old and he was still holding that and feeling like he'd failed and yet also so incredible that he was unloading it and felt lighter from it and was deciding to kind of change his self-perception in his last 48 hours of life. And he never really voiced any of that before. You never really heard him. I, mean, I remember, I was 11 when he had the stroke. I remember those years and I remember his anger and frustration. He would take his cane and hit it on the ground or when like he was trying to deal with the bills or he was trying to like he was like floundering and and you know they had to sell the house and they like it just you know there's so many indignities in that kind of situation and um, I remember him just being so defeated and um, and and actually I have a specific memory I think it, I don't remember if it's talked about in the film but he was, he was in physical therapy in, the, in those early days, like very, very major physical therapy. And he was, um, I went to, I would go after school to be with him in the physical therapy room in the hospital in the basement. And that, they didn't like have, now a physical therapist is like nice to you. That was not like that. They were like shout at him, like move your arm, move your arm. And he couldn't move his arm, it was paralyzed. And they would shout, move your arm. And he'd be back, backward over a bolster on the ground, like trembling and unable to move his arm. And I'm 11 and he's like my hero. And he was a CEO of an airline and like larger than life. And here he is on the ground trembling. He can't move his arm and he's being shouted at. It was like my world like, you know, collapsing and seeing him. And, um, and there was this moment we had when suddenly I somehow 
realized that beyond all of that, there was, we were being held, you know, this was like my first kind of God moment, that we were being held and that it didn't, like, all of this was true, but also we were being held. And something, it came over me, I had like a different look in my eyes, I looked in his eyes, he saw it, he changed, his whole body relaxed. I said, Dad, you can, you can just hold my hand. If you just move your arm, you can just, I love you, just come hold my hand. And he, he, his, he moved his left arm in a full arc and held my hand. And it was the only time he's ever moved his arm. How did I get on that topic? I don't know. But um, I think I was saying that, like, seeing him, yes, seeing him so defeated, so, so reduced, mm -hmm. so shamed, so um, vulnerable, I, 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 didn't, I didn't need to know it at age 90. I, I, I saw it at age right. 53. And... Um, you know, and we were in that whole journey together, so I, I knew. Um, but I also didn't know that still at 92, it would be the main thing he needed to talk about at the end of his life. Right. I mean, there are a lot of things he could have talked about. That was the main thing that he felt defined his life. And he took it as his own failure, and that to me was just so wrong. Thank God you're a rabbi. I, I mean, I, I mean, really? like that without, without that presence there, um, you know, it's one thing, you know, the, in some ways the funeral is the least, right? I mean, you, am I going to get up? I'm going to give a eulogy at my right. parents' funeral. Yes. Yeah. Um, but you, you, were, you were doing double duty there, both as a daughter and as a rabbi who amazingly kind of lifted this burden mm -hmm. from him, which he was able to, uh, it, you know, at least the story the film tells is, and he was able to make some peace. It was. I thought it was a. I thought it was just a remarkable example. And and just from a rabbinic perspective, I think often, you know, the Dewey can feel formulaic. Right. Here's a. Here's a. I'm going to read this declaration. You're forgiven. Is that something you do regularly? With I mean. I, I do. I. I really. Before this, I. I really try to use that ritual as a container for people to to release their sins, mm -hmm. you know, to release whatever feels, whatever's, to like really what I said to him, it. verbalize yeah. What, yeah. what is hanging on you, what is holding you, what is like, what is weighing on you, and also for their loved ones to do, to, to be in that conversation. Um, and sometimes people will do the formula. I knew my dad was ne never gonna do that formula, and so I didn't even try to do that formula with him. I just thought, like, this is not his theology. This is not, it's not how he's gonna approach this. But if I explain the concept, explain what it's trying to do, he might, he might step inside, and he, and he did. I mean, just even from a what matters perspective, that, that element of end of life, right, that, that sort of unburdening yourself is such a, a critical moment that I, I, I actually feel like I, you know, now, I'm not suggesting I'm a failure as a rabbi, I'm but, no, 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 but, but no, no. But what I'm saying is, like, it's 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 a it's a, it's an actual moment that I didn't know if people. I don't, you know, are people ready to share those kinds? I mean, you know, there's a whole lot of emotion going on at that time, and sometimes people are conscious, etc. But it was it was so powerful that it makes me rethink, mm. you know, how I mm. approach that end of life mm. with people. Mm. So thank you. I mean, it You're was welcome. it was really extraordinary. Um, I want to I want to continue along this, and we'll we'll stop for questions in about ten minutes. So if people have questions, uh, we'll we'll go we'll from there. One of the things you mentioned in um, in the forward piece uh, is this notion, of, and, and this also will connect us with what matters. Then I do want to talk about the the Jewish tradition piece. Um, the mitayafa, right? Mm. The, the good death, mm. um, which uh, is connected to the tradition and to what matters. But um, you know, you you watch this film, and I just can't imagine a more meaningful, beautiful death than mm. what your your father experienced, right? Surrounded. I mean, even just the the. The, the, the Zoom calls with people. Yeah, I'm just saying goodbye. You know, I'm, I'm going to die in a week, and <laughs> yeah. wanted to let you know I love you. And yeah. um, 
Yeah. Like, who gets that opportunity? Yeah. And, you know, to be sort of as aware as he was, surrounded by family, one by one, the grandkids come and they say goodbye, and he's giving them some life wisdom. Um, I just thought, it, you know, the, 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 the singing, right? I mean, it, it, was, it was beautiful. Uh, can you talk a little bit about this notion in our tradition of, yeah. a, of, a, of a good death, yeah. right? Because it is part of our tradition. It and, is. And the rabbis will interpret it differently. But just talk a little bit about that and how, how it figured into to this, yeah. this moment. I think it's such an important thing to teach and to know that our tradition has the concept of a good death. I think we tend to, you know, we obviously prize life as a people, we're all about life, but also death is inevitable and it's possible to have a good death and um, death doesn't have to be the enemy. You know, d death can be turned toward when, the, when it's time. And if we turn toward it, we can then set up, sometimes, sometimes, I mean, some of it is, some of it we don't get to plan at all, right? A lot of it we don't get to plan at all. But sometimes there is the ability to call the, call the people close and say all the words and tell each other we love each other and hold each other in that love and sing together and um, say goodbye, just saturate the, the room and the person with love. That's possible sometimes. Sometimes it's really not possible despite every intention. Right, but, even, but when it is, the degree to which we can be intent, e even by the way, if the ultimate decision isn't to sort of end your life, of right? Of course. Right, but the, the idea of being intentional about the end of our lives yes. and, and allowing people to say the things they want to say, I yes. thought was just incredibly meaningful. I also, I love the- uh, The tzitzit. The tzitzit. We'll talk, talk about that because I had never seen that. I mean, and we just made that up. Yeah, I yeah. mean, it was like, I, I feel like you just created a new ritual. <laughs> yeah, we just that, completely made that up. Yeah, I mean- um, Was that the tzitzit? Right. That was from his talit. It was the right? one that we cut off. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so you know, my dad was not, an observant Jew. Um, I'm the outlier in the family by a lot. Um, and um, that was actually my, my talis, um, one, of, one of my talitot. And I asked him, you know, would you want this? And he was really clear, yes, I want this. So I was cutting off the tzitzit to prepare to put it on him, um, to prepare to put it on him. And then my sister really wanted us to go around and talk to give him last words of love. And, you know, we thought, well, why not do that? And then, and then he'll have that around his wrist. And that was just completely, that does not come from anyone except us. That was just made up completely. Um, and he was buried with that on his wrist. He was buried that on his wrist and, and my, my talus on his body. I, I, I thought it was, must have been some ritual I didn't know about, but <laughs> it, it, I, 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 it's, it was incredible. It was, it was really meaningful, and yeah, um, yeah it, felt, it felt really beautiful to me that we both did the thing of, of not having the four, you know, four tzitzit, tzit, like cutting off one as you're supposed to, but then that was still with him. And it was not just with him, but it was like holding all these words of love. Yeah, it felt beautiful to me. So can we, can we turn a little bit to the tradition? Yeah. And then uh, we'll open it up for questions. Um, so you are a rabbi. I am. You're not just a daughter. You're right. you're a rabbi, and as as you say in the, you know, in the in the forward piece, um, that uh, I mean, you're aware of the kind of public nature of this film, and um, so our tradition has a lot to say about end of life decisions and what constitutes sort of removing barriers to death versus hastening death, and yes. we're we're all. I mean, I'm just. Not, I'm talking to our, to to, yes. to the community, yes. like right. We are mostly in favor of of removing barriers and not in favor of hastening, hastening death, right? Um, and there are different ways to read these sources. You acknowledge that. Um, I want to just read some of your words from the forward piece, and if we could just reflect a little bit about um, how you know how the, the shift you went through. Uh, from sort of, you know, your father, as I said, calling you up and saying, can you help me die, to um, sort of passively participating, and I think advocating now, I don't know to what yes. degree you advocate, but, 
but that you know perhaps there's room in our tradition to rethink some of these questions. Yes. Um, so you write, I raise this now in a public forum because my sister has made a film about my father's death called Last Flight Home, and her film is premiering at the, at the Sundance Film Festival. In the film, viewers will see me acting as a daughter and also a rabbi, loving and supporting my father as he ends his own life. I'm aware that this will be upsetting and even offensive to many in the Jewish community. I do not wish to create controversy on this issue, and I would not have chosen to make this film. I would not have chosen for my father's death to be viewed by the public at all, and I would, have chosen, I would not have chosen to champion this issue. But I've cared for others who desperately wish for this choice at the end of their lives, and I think it might be time for the Jewish people to reconsider our views on this important matter. Um, talk, to, talk to us a little bit about you know, how you've evolved throughout this process, because I think there's a lot of wisdom there. I mean, I, I don't know how you can watch a film like this and if we could even you know, compartmentalize a little bit our, you know, our Jewish values and our loving yeah. commitment to our parents. I don't know if I've seen a more beautiful death than, mm. than, you know, and as we learned in the film, it's, it's not like it's so easy to do this. Right. I mean, they actually make it quite, yep. quite difficult. Yep. Um, so for, from you as a rabbi, I'm curious how you sort of evolved on this. Yeah, I've come, I've come quite a distance because now I am actually advocating for this. I'm actually the film is being shown to the New York State Legislature and I'm being asked to speak to legislators and um, I've come to really believe that this should be a right that people have. Now that's different than Jewish tradition. It could be a right, a civil, civic, civil right Correct. and not, we might as Jews still think that we shouldn't do it as Jews. Um, I, I, um, I've come to feel, think that the, the sources we have the halakha is not in any way equivocal. It is completely clear, like completely clear that we do not hasten death. At the time that my dad died, even the reform movement mm -hmm. called it murder in, the, in their latest responsum at that time. They have now written new responsum that completely reverses that. Um, the conservative movement, I know Elliot Dorf has written some things that have kind of opened up some possibility but certainly in orthodoxy and in the traditional sources, it is not a question. Right. Um, what the reform responsum did that I thought was really important was look at what was the expected, what was the typical dying process in the time that the rabbis were writing. And they talk about, the rabbis talk about that, that like the average, the typical death was about four days or five days. And that a death more than seven days was excessive suffering. And so, so that's, we're talking now, in, we're in a world where, like my father, was on so many medical interventions. I mean, so many things have kept him alive. From when he was 53, I'm very glad they kept him alive. Mm -hmm. but he was on oxygen. He wouldn't be able to live at all without oxygen. He was on oxygen every day. It wasn't like he was just, we, there was kind of a natural process happening and we're hastening death. There was all kinds of things that have been done to keep him alive. It's far, far longer than the rabbis were ever imagining a life being prolonged. And sometimes I think what's happened is with all of our amazing medical interventions, we have, in some cases, trapped people in an existence that, ha that, that is not, that is, that is suffering for them. And I think it is time for us to recognize that the conditions of dying are dramatically different now than they were in the time of the rabbis. And therefore, we need to adapt our laws to meet the conditions that people, real people are actually living with um, and dying with. I think that when a person is terminally ill, they're going to die. And they are clear, and they are of sound mind, and they are clear that their life has become suffering to them, that they do not want to be in the world anymore. I think that we ought to be listening to them and that it is merciful to allow them to end their lives. And it is, it is, I think in some cases, cruel to require them to stay alive until their bodies finally give out, despite the fact that they, in mo most cases, have been kept alive by our interventions. Right, oh, yeah. and, and in some ways, um, you know, there are examples, even, I mean, at least in the conservative movement, of rabbis 
reading things like, for example, um, uh, if someone's in a persistent vegetative state, not not uh, you know giving them you know yeah, hydration, hydration because sure. it's they consider it medication. Right. And, right. I mean, so. You know, there are ways. Right? So, or, yes. or medicating people over yes. the suggested limits, yes, right. which yes. you know will, event, yes. will cause death. Yes. But, so, there are ways. People are right. doing things all the time anyway. We Correct. know that. So, and and I, think the, I think the acknowledgement is exactly what you just described, is that we're keeping people alive today in ways in which the rabbinic sources couldn't have imagined. And it's, it's a great sort of you know, historical, contextual, Wissenschaft, <laughs> right? But what that's who expect? we are. Right. Yeah. And that's who we are, and we understand that that, that uh, halakha developed in a certain historical context. Right. And um, so you're, you're make, but you, I, I, want, I want to be clear that this is, you know, you're making, and, and I'm curious to read the reform response because I, I think that there's actually a compelling case here in the film. And, and um, but, but you're, you're not just speaking as a citizen, uh, you're, you're speaking, speaking as, as a rabbi, rabbi who is advocating you know, things like mercy and compassion. I am. And, right. I am. And the, the reform response um, quote Rav Soloveitchik saying that law without tenderness is wickedness. Yeah. And I think that's a really good guiding principle is that it has to come from a place of mercy. And when a person's begging us and they're suffering, like I had a congregant who had ALS, was desperate, desperate. And didn't live in New Jersey. If you live in New Jersey, you can do it. If you live right. in New York, you can't. And you know that's why? Why? Why would why would we require him to suffer to the end? Like like, what's what's in it? And, the, and you know, obviously, the principle for us is life, right? Is right. never ever wanting to cheapen life, never ever wanting a person to be pressured to end their life, never ever wanting life uh, to be anything but the most sacred, valued, prized thing. That so, you acknowledge, right? We, we all acknowledge that's, that. That's right? it. No, and, and the question is, when a person is dying anyway, they're, they're terminally ill, and they are saying that they are suffering, is it honoring life to require them to stay alive? Is that actually what honoring life looks like? To me, I, I think no. I think honoring life in certain cases, when, you know, when they're of some mind, when they're terminally ill, that honoring life can look like letting them Say goodbye. Yeah, and, um, it's it's a. I mean, in some ways, the the film is a uh, is just a textbook example of the mm -hmm. argument you're making, right? To be able to allow people to uh, to die with dignity, and in a lot of ways, it it, it feeds into um, some of the questions we ask. You know, what matters you know, intake, right? Like what, what makes a meaningful life for you? What is, I mean, we're asking those questions so people can sort of imagine if I'm ever, if I'm ever unable to make medical decisions for myself, you know, yeah. what, what's the criteria by which I define a meaningful life, yeah. uh, a life worth living? And right, in a way you're taking out that, or the reform response uh, is taking out the, the the persistent you, you know like I'm I'm conscious yes. I'm I'm yes. I can make my own decisions yes. and I for me yes. I've reached a point in my life where life right it, it would be better to to end my life at this point yes. with the suffering than yes. and I could say goodbye to my family yeah and yeah 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 that's where I've come to and. Do you have any, is there any pushback in your, I mean, do, do people push back on you when, in the community? When or? I wrote the forward piece, so before, I, before that went out, of course, I needed to write to my congregation and say, hey, guess right. what? I'm in this movie <laughs> on this topic, and I'm writing this public piece, and I'm about to be associated with this issue, and letting you know. And um, I, I wasn't sure what to expect. I got a few hundred responses, and there were some people who said, I'm not sure if I agree with you, but of course, like, you know, you're your father's daughter, like, of, of course, this was, I support you to do this. And I support you as my rabbi to take positions of conscience that you need to take. Like, that was the, I never, I didn't have anybody say, and I really expected some people to be right. offended. Nobody said that to me. No one seems to have been. Um, in the forward piece, I definitely expected that because it's the general public, general Jewish public. Zero negative 
mail, several hundred letters, almost all people saying, when my husband died, when my mother died, I wished, or I did, or I did illegally, or I did, you know, in the ways you just talked about of like upping the morphine or whatever, like, and this law needs to change and Judaism needs to change. Every single person, I had rabbis write to me anonymously that they, that they wouldn't be public about it, but they agreed. I had, I mean, it was amazing. I had no idea that I was stumbling into something where there was so much feeling, so much experience, and so much support, and no, not one negative response. Yeah, I suspect that, and I don't, I'm not trying to speak for all conservative rabbis, but my sense is, is that privately, if, if a congregant were to come and have this conversation in a what matters type of way, or um, I, it's, it would be hard for me to imagine saying to that person, well, you know, I mean, I, they might want to know, you know, what the tradition has to say. They probably know by the time they get to me. But to, to not be supportive privately without coming out publicly right. about it, it would seem to me that I would be hard pressed to imagine yeah. not supporting someone who, you know, had given this the thought and yeah. gone through the process. Yeah. Um, but <sighs> powerful topic. Um, Let's take some questions. All right. uh, we can just start in the front, Mara, and I'm going to channel Rabbi Cosgrove and remind you that a question ends with a question. Hi mark. there. It's a short statement. All right. Go ahead. Um, I want to hear the best sign that you got from your father since he's passed. Oh, wow. <laughs> Did you watch the film? Uh huh. Um, so my dad was really, my dad had not really believed, he was not a big believer. But as you saw toward the end of his life, he was certain that he was going to be watching us. He was going to be protecting us. OK, so something amazing happened. Um, my mom uh, fell in her kitchen. That's not amazing. She was not hurt, but she couldn't get up. And she was on the floor, and she's by herself. And she kind of pushed her, like it took her a long time, but she pushed her way over to the couch that you see her on in the film, and she got onto the couch. And she was just about to pick up the phone to call us um, when there was somebody in the doorway. And it was Cooper. Cooper from the film, the, my dad's caretaker. He had been driving along. He had not seen her in a year. He had not seen her since what you saw. He'd been driving along, and he heard my dad's voice say, go to Lisa. <laughs> and then he was like, you know, that's crazy. So he kept driving, and he heard it again, go to Lisa. And he turned his car around, and he came. That's a sign. Yeah. Wow. Out of curiosity, um, you said you were 11 when your father had the stroke. And um, is there any way that that possibly influenced your decision to become a rabbi to make sense of, of that? I, um, it's mysterious to me how I decided to become a rabbi. I was not your typical candidate for rabbinical school. As a young person, I was not. I did not have a positive experience in my childhood synagogue. I did not feel like that was going to be a place that I was going to spend a lot of time. Um, and, but that experience I just described of this physical therapy room, that was important in my life, that moment. And then many years later, when, I mean, I was in my mid-20s, I really started seeking about God. And I um, kind of plunged into Jewish life at that point. And then like a decade after that, decided to become a rabbi. So I'm like what they call a second career rabbi. Um, but I think that, I, yeah, I think that, um, you know, I grew up aware that everything is precious and it's fleeting and you don't know what's coming next. And, um, you know, life can turn, turn in a moment. And um, I saw a lot of triumph of the spirit um, and character in my family. I think that those were really formative. I saw another hand. And then we'll go to Joan. Handle this side first, Joan, then we'll go to you. All right. I think the remark that disturbed me most in the film was, I believe it was your sister who said all the stories that would remain untold. 
all the stories that your father had that would remain untold. You have to understand that I view this as a person who became a widow at 40 with little kids. All the stories that remain untold. There is a certain selfishness in denying the grandchildren, even the children, you, those stories that remain untold. It's difficult enough to say goodbye when it happens, but the idea of prolonging this readiness to die. I mean, my husband died, he, he stroked and he had an aneurysm and, and it was over in hours. Rabbi Nadich talked me through, kept me sane for two hours, <laughs> sitting on the phone in, the, in a hospital room in, the, in the Roosevelt Hospital until his brother could come. But all the stories that remain untold, who will give your family back those stories? I, mean, I feel like, you know, I, I, I opened by talking about how much I didn't want this film made. Um, I now very much say whenever, you know, I'm, I'm out with my sister talking to, about the film, I was wrong. Like, like, she gave us such a big gift. His story got told in, I mean, obviously not every story, but more than most people, his story got told and is shared with people and people fall in love with my dad all over the place and all these people are contacting me and they saw it on Amazon and they're, you know, Amazon Prime and they're like, you know, call me and say like, I, I, I fell in love with your dad. I feel like we, my, I'm not worried about my dad's story not being told. His story got, I, I recognize that what you're saying that there are all kinds of stories that weren't told in this film and that haven't been told, but for our family, we, we have this very lucky thing that my sister did make this film and on balance, it's created so many amazing conversations. I mean, I, I, so many conversations I've had with people who've watched it, with audiences about the meaning of life, the meaning of death, the meaning of love, the meaning of family. Um, I personally feel, if anything, like it's time to, you know, move the spotlight to some other people's families. <laughs> um, but I think that what you're saying is, is important, which is that every person has so many stories that their life contains. And I think that's why, as a people, we focus so much on memory and commit ourselves, you know, throughout the year, we're coming up on another Yisker and Pesach, like, commit ourselves again and again and again and again and again, like to remember to tell part of, a next part of the story and another part of the story, and what about this part of the story? And I love that about Shiva, you know, when, when, when the family learns things about their beloved who died that they didn't even know, but they're hearing it from a business associate or a neighbor or, you know, and they get new stories. And I always think of it as like, every one of those stories is like a thread and we're making a new tapestry and we keep adding threads. And I always just say like, tell more stories, tell more stories. And so I think that's a beautiful thing about us is that we really try to tell the stories. And I encourage us to do that. And we don't actually have to wait until a person dies, right? I think that's maybe what you're saying is like, let's make sure we're talking about it now. And that's what I meant to say at, in my sermon at the end. It's like, none of this has to wait, right? We can tell each other how much we love each other. We can show each other how much we love each other. We can tell all the stories. We don't have to wait. Well, I think, and then Joan, we'll come to you. I think also, it really does provide a, um, an opportunity for people to watch this and understand, as you said, the, there can be beauty in death. And you didn't say that exactly. No, but, but yes, I would say but, that. But there, there can be beauty and there can be meaning and there can be an opportunity to share emotions, things unsaid. And I don't know, I don't think all, even if you take away the decision of your father to end his life, right? Yep. Um, I don't know, I, I, I think that most deaths aren't like that. And this is an opportunity for people to see what the possibilities are. Yep. And I think that's a great gift that, that, the fa that your family gave us. Thank you. Yeah. I, do feel, I do feel, as a rabbi, I get to be in lots of rooms. It might not be quite like what, what was on the film, you know, my father's death, but lots of rooms where there's, it's just the room is just so full of love. Yep. Tears and love and beauty. Yep. Yep. Joan. Thank you. Um, your dad had such a whimsical quality yes. in his use of the language yes. that he was a perfect um, 
subject <laughs> yeah. of this, and I, it, he was very endearing. Um, not a value judgment, but a halachic question. Yes, sure. If you made a distinction between um, foregoing ongoing medication in the case of terminal illness, as opposed to inserting then an active uh, use of new medication to hasten death, is there a, a judgment uh, halachically um, between those two? I think I, my understanding would be like, for example, if we had just taken off his oxygen, that's, that would be halakhically permitted. Correct. But his death would be, a, my understanding would be like a particularly terrible, like he would be like he was drowning and he would be gasping for air and he would be, it would be particularly terrible. But I think that would have been an option. Or he could have stopped eating and drinking. But according to the halakha, is there a differential between yes. the yes, two? Yes, there yes. is. Yes, yeah, yes. Sure. the thing we did violates halakha. There were other options that would not have they would have been harder. And, and maybe, maybe one would say, okay, if you really want this, do the harder thing. That is a, a, a possible response. And in the case of, of stopping medication, it might have taken the same 14 days. In any case, right. but it might have been a more difficult That's right. uh, suffering That's 14 right. days for the, the, the patient. That's right. Where you had, were able to avoid that. But halakhically, yes, there is a difference. Any, any other questions? Um, we do. Uh, same row, right, right there, Mona? Hi. I just wonder if the healing process for you and your family might have been any easier because you were prepared. It was definitely easier for me that he wanted to die because I didn't have to think it, this was not a tragic thing for him. <laughs> like, I was sad, I missed him, but he, had, he, he was at peace with his, he was very clearly at peace with this and wanted, was ready to go. And that to me, and I've been with lots of people who you know, didn't do medical aid in dying, but who were ready to go, and I think that it often is a little bit comforting to the family to know my, my loved one was at peace with dying. Um, so I think that was, that was important. Um, Look, the fact that I, I, knew, I knew the date he was going to die, weeks before he died, that was a crazy thing. And it meant that like, I booked my flight knowing exactly how much time I would have with him and could then plan like, oh, I'll do the Vidui on the day before. Like, I, like that is strange. Um, I think that it did in some way allow the conditions for us to create a lot of beauty at the end, but I certainly that would not be a reason to do, I mean, that's, it would not be a reason to do that. Um, but I, but I think, um, I would say that, that I see a similarity to your question with other people who have loved ones who have, you know, were, were ill for a long time and, they, and they'd anticipated the death for a long time. That, like, I had been, when I moved, I moved here eight years ago, I told the hiring committee, like, I'm probably going to go in the next year. My father's probably going to die this year. I'm probably going to go back. Like, we had been thinking he was going to die for a very long time. So I, th I think that that's a common experience that people have when, when they have infirm loved ones who are, you know, in and out of the hospital, and it's just not clear when it's going to happen. And I think that does make a difference in the grieving process, because you start to grieve, in, in, at least in my experience. You can never really grieve until it's final, for sure, but you start to adjust yourself to the idea of this person leaving the world, and no matter how much you hate that idea, it becomes somewhat familiar to you, and I, I do think that that has an effect, I think it had an effect on my, on my grief. Though my grief was, despite it all, despite it being his choice, despite he was 92, despite the fact that he had, you know, almost died when he was 53, like, I, I still went through the full depth of that experience, like I've seen so many other people do. You know, it's also interesting that this, because I also lost my father during COVID, so, mm. right, the, the COVID experience of burial and funerals mm. and shiva was far different, mm -hmm. so I don't know about you, in my case, it was, you know, five of us at the graveside, mm -hmm. and there was no real shiva, and 
you know, the, the instruments of mourning that are so you know, important to us uh, were, were not there. Yeah. So, you know, on the one hand, you had this incredible experience at the end of his life, but I suspect yeah. that the Shiva was different than it would have been, yeah. you know, had it not been pandemic times. That's true. It was Zoom, Shiva, and, yeah. um, and, I'd, and I'd walked so many people through that. Correct. And, and like the profound isolation of that, of being a mourner without people in your house and being yeah. like just, it's, it was so hard. So your sister got married after the film, yes. right? Uh, how's yes. your mom doing? How's everybody in the family? Like just, Thank you. just checking sure. in. You, you, she you fell, know I know. I you know, hope she's doing yeah. better. You all know them now. Right. Um, my mom is actually still really having a hard time. Yeah. Um, for a while there with the film, there was like exciting news every day. It was like there was a screening here and there was this panel there and we were flying around the country and it was like really a lot of, a lot. And I think it was distracting for a while. I think it was energizing for a while. I think, it, I, I mean, she's loved everybody laughing at his jokes and you know, mm -hmm. that like, whoa. It's, that's been a pretty amazing thing for her to have all these people love her husband. Um, but she's, she's, she's having a hard time. And my, my sister, yeah, my sister's um, actually just put out another film, uh, amazingly enough, um, and is working on a film. Actually, she's working on a film about, I, my congregation is in a partnership with a Black Baptist church, and she's working on a film about that partnership in addition to a few other projects. She's also working on a scripted v version of my dad's life, so. At this time, you know you're being filmed for a documentary, though, right? At yeah. this time, I, I actually, like, okay. believe, yes. You're, you're aware. I right. am now aware. Um, I don't know if Rachel Maddow saw this uh, film. We, of course, she, of course, approved it, uh, but I, I don't know if her people approved it or if she watched it or anything, and I have no idea, but that was a funny yeah, part Barbara, of it, yeah. Yeah, Barbara, thanks for bringing it. That was a great scene, by the way. <laughs> it was really great. Uh, a lot of great stuff from your father politically, and I'm sure we only heard a, a oh, small. Yeah, you know. some of it was really graphic. Um, I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> um, last thing, the the sermon you gave on Yom Kippur is it up yeah. online? Yeah, or, yeah. It's on I want to I want to recommend everybody goes to the website of your mm -hmm. synagogue. It's I mean the the, the clip that was in the movie mm -hmm. was extraordinary okay. and. Um, it's just beautiful Torah mm, thank you. for us to think about because we all, you know, none of us escape life without walking through this mm. this valley. So it's, it's uh, really some important guidance for us. Rabbi Timoner, I want to thank you thank so you much for so joining much. us for you know for the film and for for your um, honesty and, and you. transparency about it all. And uh, we just hope that your father's memory continues to be a blessing to you and your family. And um, thanks again for being here. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Thank you for those who are online. And uh, we wish you all a good night.